Donald Cutler. I was born in Putnam, Connecticut. A long time ago. <laughs> well, 59 is when I started. Trying to work a full-time job and race every weekend. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of it in Europe. The stuff in Europe was the international six-day trials. It was uh, just... We're talking two-wheel dirt bikes. Yeah, yeah. In the 70s? Yep. So what kind of a motorcycle were you riding on? Well, the first time when I went to Spain, I was on a Husqvarna. Oh, wow. And the only time I ever rode one. Somebody, well, somebody that I knew that was in, in that, uh, he had been there before, been to, you know, over Europe and stuff. And he was an importer for uh, Penton KTM. So he, he said, you ever want to do the six days? And I said, yeah. He said, well, I got a extra, extra Husqvarna sitting over there in Spain with nobody to ride it. So guess where I went? They fly you over? <laughs> he didn't pay much on expenses, <laughs> but I was in this country, I was already riding for a Spanish manufacturer, OSA. And so while I was here, they paid everything. And then after that, I rode uh, I think six more six days, uh, five or six more six days. It was, uh, and they were all on the OSA. So I got all my expenses paid for that, flying all over the place. I was a, the top, pretty much the top rider in New England for that type of riding. When I started, I bought some piece of junk that was 10 years old that some guy it broke down so much on him that he threw it on the ground one day at a track, opened the gas cap and threw a match in and walked away. Oh, they got the fire out right away. And, uh, it just needed a little paint and, and a lot of other things. But uh, I paid $125 for it. Uh, did you make it run better than he did? I was winning everything in New England on that thing out by the time I got done with it. All these other little sponsors, the guys that got names all over their suits and, no, there wasn't any of that back then. <laughs> no. So did you work on your own bikes? Yeah. Is that why you were winning? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, and you can ride okay too, probably. No, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> I set up all six, we went with a six-man team and I set up all six bikes to go over with. I made all the modifications I wanted for the event in 1971 on the Isle of Man. It was a uh, open course, you know, uh, roads and <clears throat> roads and woods. And uh, on the Isle of Man, there isn't too much woods because okay. uh, they cut all the trees, <laughs> but a lot of mud. What's one of your favorite memories from those days? Probably Spain. Beautiful country, beautiful women. <laughs> <laughs> that always helps. <laughs> You don't have a whole lot of time. You have to turn the bike in every night and nobody can touch it. You can't work on it, you can't. So any work you do on it, you have 10 minutes in the morning before you ride. Yeah. And any time you can get ahead of schedule during the day, you can work on it. Yeah. And you're not allowed any help or any outside parts. Most of the major parts are marked on it so that, uh, supposedly you can't change them. <laughs> well, we learned a lot from the Italians. They were really good at it. <laughs> at the time, anyway. <laughs> Rules have all changed now, and they can work on almost anything. They can all change right, well. parts, and yeah, they can do just about anything. I, I rode most of the stuff up and down the East Coast, and some in Canada. Uh, I was uh, 40 years old when I quit, but I was still I was still winning events. But um, and I got hurt that year. Uh, that that was going to put me out for a while, and it takes you a while to come back if you're laying there with your leg in the air. And <laughs> At 40, yeah, there you go. 
The people I worked for in Connecticut, I'd been with them for 22 years. Wow. I gave them a year's notice. I'm a machinist. Okay. So I was running a machine shop for them and driving truck for them uh, or running heavy equipment, whatever they wanted, because we had everything. We, they would go to auctions and buy things that weren't, you know, that weren't broke or something. They bought a motel. So we went and finished the motel. Oh, it didn't run very long before they had a problem with the surge. Uh -oh. uh, the leach field wasn't up to it. I spent most of one summer up there building a new, a new leach field a long way from there, ran a pipeline to it with pumps and all of this stuff. <clears throat> Pretty much like Sugarloaf and, and pumping it up over Bigelow Hill. That's kind of what we were up against down there. Well, we built everything our, ourselves, even the machinery we were doing the processing with well, was built right in-house. Because we didn't want anyone knowing how, how a, it was a government job. And we didn't want anyone knowing how to do it. So it was, didn't let anyone, anyone in uh, that wasn't authorized to be in there. Secret. We, uh, there was one place that we went that we delivered stuff to that you back the truck in, a guard went with you to back the truck in, unhook the tractor and you left the trailer there until they unloaded it and then he'd go back in with you and get the empty trailer. Uh, Atomic Energy Commission in Paducah, Kentucky took one job in uh, outside of Camden, New Jersey. There was a, a World War II shipyard there that they were dismantling it. And that's what we did. We'd go down there with two tractor trailers every week, dismantle a bunch of stuff and haul it out of there. Some of it we cut apart, some of it we were, okay, we can make something different out of this. And that's what we did a lot of. I, there wasn't anyone else there that knew the whole, the whole operation. And I thought they'd have somebody follow me around, see what was going on, and they never did, so uh, it didn't matter. The day I was going to leave, I just left. I got tired of Connecticut, and I'd been up this area before, and I'd been to the Northwest before, and it was one or the other. So, this was closer to my relatives, so I came here. Well, 76 is when I... Uh, was up here looking around because okay. that, that was the year I quit racing. Um, I started looking around and the funny story on that too, I ran into Hazen, Hazen McMullen and Bud Jordan. Bud was running a little coffee shop in town, in Kingfield. And it was the weekend before hunting season. So, uh, there were a whole lot of hunters around. There was nothing open, not even that coffee shop. But Hazen and Bud were in there drinking coffee, so we went up and he said, well, we're not open, but you can have some coffee if you want. So we sat down and kind of just talking there, and the hunters started showing up. Uh, Marsha says, uh, you cook, I'll serve. So we opened a restaurant <laughs> just for that day. First, I went over to Perkins Machine looking for a job over there, and he wasn't interested. And there was another one over um, Anson Valley Road or something like that. There was another machine shop there, and they weren't interested. So I ended up uh, going to the mountain. And the, f the first summer I was up there, Hazen wanted to pull the gearboxes out of the gondola and sent me and the gearboxes over to Perkins to rebuild them. By the time I got done there, oh, I hadn't been there very long and his guys were coming to me for, how do you do this, how do you do... Uh, when I got all done with that, I, I went in the office to see the Perkins and he, he said, I made a mistake. 
<laughs> so the mountain was lucky enough to get you because of that. Yeah. Yeah. And you did a lot of making lifts go in the next several years, didn't you? Yeah. Shouldn't have. We got we would have well, maybe we would have got new lifts. Maybe we would have just left them lay there. <laughs> well, I know, because I was there, that the mantra was, make it run and don't ask for any money to do it because there isn't any. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, we have no money. Just do whatever you can to make the lift run. Correct? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I went on spillway when they made so much snow on a chair that it pulled the tower over. Uh, we hooked a couple of cables to the top of it and started pulling on it and we cut the bottom right off and stood it up and then welded it back together. Uh, and left the cable, we left one cable on it. Right. Uh, hooked to a big boulder up on the side of the mountain. I had to go down to Lewiston and, uh, and be deposed. <laughs> well, I didn't hear anything for 10 years. It was, it was a completely different accident, the reason I got called in. Okay. Uh, when a guy f fell off down around Tower 9 or something, I forget just what tower it was, because I wasn't even there. I hadn't been there for 10 years. So, uh, yeah, I had to go answer a few questions over that, but, oh, it was, uh, That particular lift had been, a lot of the Borvig lifts had been made to, uh, in the wind, the ship trains were supposed to move. So instead of the cable getting blown off of the shivs, it would, but then the, the problem was the uh, friction in the bushings, it wouldn't let it come back. So when the wind stopped blowing, then it tried to run off the other side of the shiv. So, and none of the new lifts, even though the ones that Borvig made, was rigid. They weren't. They didn't swing. So I, uh, I made a strut to go in there to keep the things from from swinging at all, one way or the other. <clears throat> and before I made any of those changes, I'd make drawings and send them to the manufacturer and our insurance company and get them okayed by both of them before I actually did the, the modifications. And what that was, they said, uh, the turnbuckle you put in there to adjust that shiv train broke. I said, uh -uh. no, <laughs> I never put a turnbuckle in them. I made them rigid and they weren't supposed to be adjusted after that. Uh, someone cut that because they wanted to be able to adjust it, swing it in or out or whatever. Um, uh, I don't know if they ever really found who did that. What did you like about that job? You never knew what you were going to run into when you came in in the morning. <laughs> what was the best part of it? The days that nothing was wrong and I just went skiing. <laughs> I like this. When, when I see something with a problem, I like to come up with a solution. And I was pretty free to do all of that up there. You can just go out and do it. You didn't have to uh, stir up a lot of hornet's nests. Or, or three T-bar. Uh, some, some of the wands they had would get a crack in them and the thing would shut down. Just vibration would shut it down but you couldn't find it, you couldn't see the thing. So I started making my own derail switches and it had to actually knock the thing out of there and it, and it would dangle on a little cable. So you just either ride a ski through, up through there and you could see what, was, what the problem was. It was pretty easy to fix because it would just snap back into place. You didn't have to find any new parts or anything on number three. I was at, I was at the top of five 
in a thunderstorm one day. And a bolt of lightning is circling around the room. I got out and walked down in the pouring rain in the, in the thunder shower. As opposed to staying at the top of the Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they didn't want to hire a helicopter because it's not real cheap. Uh, one year they decided we were going to pour all the concrete without the helicopter. Um, I made a thing to go on the back of a skidder that would hold a concrete bucket and we tow trucks up as far as we could get them and dump into those buckets on the back of the, of the skidder and he'd back down to, to where the tower was going to be, dump it and come back up. We had two skidders run, running back and forth there. And somebody said this, says, you've been here all your life? And I said, no, no, not yet, but, I, but I've been here close to 50 years. And most of it right here, other than the mountain. 